Hello, I'm joined today by Shasheen Saraf, who is Senior VP and Global Head of Digital BSS at Conviva. Hello, Shasheen. Hi, Ken. I mean, um, perhaps we can talk about what are the guiding principles for adopting a future-ready digital BSS strategy? So let me set a context for this question. It's a very good question. And a lot of customers, prospects uh, do discuss these points with us uh, in our different meetings and discussions. So traditionally, um, uh, BSS is set of systems that does customer management and revenue management for a telecom operator. And the, the way uh, these systems work is they connect the human beings on the network that is provided by the operator and they subscribe to a certain plans at certain price and basically leverage this ecosystem to carry out their work, uh, talk to uh, people and uh, you know use some of those uh, data services for their uh, home purpose. Now these are very human to human type of uh, uh, interactions that is enabled by Telco at a very uh, standard subscription model. The whole uh, effort by a telecom operator is to onboard more and more customers, do the customer acquisitions and maintain their uh, revenue streams. But as you see um, uh, how the technology disruptions and innovation is driving this industry, uh, you will see there are digital lifestyle players uh, coming into the market. And uh, the whole uh, telco or the telecom operators are now looking at an opportunity to tap this market of offering services that helps a particular individual to enjoy the digital new life services. It could be in the domain of like IoT, entertainment, it could be uh, in the area like health, healthcare, and some of those things. And then there are some futuristic uh, use cases like autonomous cars. Uh, and what it all underlies one thing is the, the human to human uh, communication is now translating or rather, uh, I would say moving to a human to non-human type of entities like sensors, machines, uh, and other things with uh, human beings. So what it means is the BSS processes, the customer and the revenue management processes will have to start off uh, tackle this, uh, uh, the, the, the whole non-human actors are the entities in the ecosystem. Second thing you will say is uh, uh, there are, uh, the big opportunities to tap the whole value chain beyond telecom services, the traditional voice and data, right? There are third party players, uh, you know, they bring certain value to your lifestyle services or to an enterprise digital solutions. And then bundling these with your telecom uh, services creates a huge value chain that goes beyond a telco ecosystem. Uh, so this whole uh, uh, disruption or changes cannot be monetized by telco if they continue to uh, go with the subscription model that they have used traditionally, where you know uh, the 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 customer has a certain subscription for services and certain price, and it largely doesn't change over its life lifetime. And, and if I move from one operator to another operator, largely there is no differentiation. It's the same similar uh, price plans and, 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 and the subscription plans. So then Telco needs to not only differentiate and, and, but also support some of these new uh, market trends that I just spoke about by changing the whole monetization model. What it means is, if they are doing just cost plus margin kind of uh, subscription models, they will have to move from that 
to a value driven subscription models so it means they will have to bring some of these new uh, monetization techniques like plans based on transactions plans based on consumption uh, plans where number of partners come together and deliver a particular lifestyle service in a very unique way so so there is going to be some sort of an hybrid situation where telco continues to uh, to to offer their traditional connectivity services and they will keep doing that it won't change that remains their number one priority however there is going to be this new monetization new subscription model new business models if i have to use that word will start dominating a lot of uh, uh, you know the the offerings by telecom operators so there is going to be a hybrid situation <clears throat> now if this is the future this is what we see for next uh, few years comviva has come up with a strategy or the guiding principle the five or six salient features that i would like to talk about and the first and most important is support this hybrid kind of a situation for for telecom operators where they have a legacy uh, connectivity services continue to handle that uh, but define some of the uh, use cases that will enable to, uh, to to enable the legacy architecture the legacy setup for the new digital experience so some of the things that will happen is there will be more needs of uh, overlay solutions uh, on top of the current legacy setup that a telco has and at the same time there will be some of the greenfield setups that will happen with 5g and some other technology disruptions that we talked about and there will be a hybrid setup that the bss will have to manage for a telecom operator for foreseeable future that's the first one the second one is the agility uh this guiding principle is is now very very if, almost in every uh, rfp that we respond agility is becoming more important the customers do not want to wait for 36 months for the transformation or changes they want to do it in 6 months 9 months max 12 months kind of timelines so what it means is uh, while telcos have been traditionally very good in building networks design networks rollout networks the whole customer experience and bringing the agility to deliver that experience on their customer facing systems uh, needs a lot of innovation and that is where we have built some accelerators templates we have sort of uh, productized our best practices we have built some of the platforms also to bring that agility. Also, the software delivery process has become extremely agile uh, by leveraging some of our uh, uh, best practices that we have uh, used uh, for the clients globally for last so many years. The third part is, which is very close to what I just talked about, the agility, is the whole platform approach. Uh, sixty percent, seventy percent capabilities have to come out of box. If you have to deliver the transformation in six to nine months, so we have adopted a very open API, uh, pre-integrated stack approach. Whether it's a partner stack that we are using or it's our own Bluemarble stack we are using, we have created a, a platform ecosystem that can dramatically reduce the transformation timelines uh, to few months and and also we are we are focused on open api architecture so that any integration uh, or any of those challenges that we come across the open architecture would bring the standardization across our engagements uh, the fourth is we targeting most of our contracts and opportunities around business outcomes so you see more and more our proposals more and more our contracts and engagements are driven by our commitment to bring certain business outcome for our customers, whether it is 
uh, running their business in a certain efficient efficient manner or bring the change into their IT ecosystem uh, based on some business uh, KPIs like time to market, time to launch, uh, cycle time and those kind of things. And then the third one is uh, bring some additional revenue to our customers through the changes that we are proposing. So there is this whole outcome-based ecosystem that is getting a lot of uh, uh, acceptability in the customer's mindset. Uh, last two are obviously the whole uh, uh, data privacy and adaptive security. Now these two things have become extremely important in the global uh, ecosystem. The security has been uh, a sort of a, a backbencher for many years, but with the, with the whole uh, internet-based uh, and different channels that customers want to use to access the systems, the security has become a very important part of our strategy and the data, as I said, the data privacy, there has to be enough protection in the systems that the data is not misused by anybody. So based on this five or six guiding principles, uh, our future DS, we are very confident that we'll tackle any future uh, uh, BSS uh, uh, disruptions or the trains that are getting set up uh, all the time. Okay, well, thanks for that very detailed and informative answer. And obviously, you mentioned it very important innovation is key. And you also mentioned revenue generation. Now, I know that you've recently launched a new BSS product suite. It's called Blue Marble. Now, is that ready to monetize 5G services right now? Is it ready? Yeah. So to answer that question, Ken, um, so look at the traditional 3G, 4G enterprise uh, networks. That is, a, as I was talking a few minutes back, there's a connectivity and then there are systems to, to manage the, the customers and the revenue. Uh, however, in 5G, uh, you have the whole, this concept of slicing the physical network into multiple uh, slices, virtual slices that can be used for different business purpose. For example, uh, the 5G network can, uh, you know, one can create a slice that that helps your IoT, a massive IoT kind of use case. And the same network, you can create a slice, say that suppose uh, supports the the healthcare kind of use cases. Both needs, uh, if I go by common sense, I would have put two BSS systems to manage two different types of uh, use cases and because they're completely different network slices. However, uh, we have come out with a very uh, innovative uh, blue marble capability or a slice to price, which allows me to use a single stack to manage the different uh, network slices and dynamically price those slices for different use cases for different requirements and enable, which is the, the business model that is getting very popular, which is B2B2C, uh, that particular business model uh, is what we are targeting in our slice to price uh, Blue Marble use case implementation. The good part is we have a tier one customer in Europe where we already deployed this and piloted successfully. Uh, and they are just started monetizing some of that stack for their uh, 5G customers. Okay. And um, this is all about digital transformation, isn't it? And if you look at the bigger industry picture, there seems to be greater adoption of cloud native technologies, microservices. How far do you think CSPs are embracing this new wave of technology? Yeah, good question. And then, and just to uh, 
just to begin an answer for that question, our Blue Marble platform is completely cloud native and microservices based architecture. And then there are reasons uh, I would like to quickly bring to the table. We can divide this into two parts. Uh, one is a cloud which is largely about uh, uh, bringing the uh, infrastructure into the play. And then there are microservices which are largely around building your uh, IT stack, the software assets on top of your cloud. Most of the service operators, the telecom operators are adopting uh, cloud uh, and migrating their existing applications. 95% uh, telcos are legacy brownfield. So their first step is always to, to migrate their assets onto cloud and gain some cost savings out of that. Uh, how does that happen? Uh, obviously, when you are on a traditional infrastructure, you have the whole ecosystem to monitor your, your hardware, servers, observability, uh, monitoring, and the whole refresh cycles that, that take place like few weeks to months. All that when you move to cloud uh, gets collapsed to a significant extent, and you can leverage the cloud native tool ecosystem to manage uh, the entire uh, uh, the hardware part. That gives a lot of cost savings that can be reinvested in some of the other initiatives in the, uh, in the operator's uh, ecosystem. Now, once you move to cloud, obviously the software that is sitting on that needs to take the advantage of that cloud architecture, which means that uh, if with the same monoliths, the same COTS products go and sit as it is, is not going to give those benefits in terms of uh, you know uh, while the while the hardware is scalable and is available, the whole software aspect in the way that for digital challenges it needs to be uh, you know possible to uh, change quickly, uh, bring modifications faster, launch my products uh, quicker, and to make it happen it needs to be uh, broken into what is called as microservices, where uh, the operator will have a more granular control on the functionality and bring those changes or the whole IT cycles uh, to a very uh, attractive uh, and uh, smaller uh, timelines. So uh, the the, the argument could be that if we had to refactor our current applications or migrate them into microservices to take the advantage of uh, the whole digital uh, transformation, there is a cost involved to do that. But there is a whole ROI model we are building for our customers where we are explaining them that by investing in some of these microservices, your ability to launch new products, your ability to get more revenue, uh, bring some acceleration will go significantly. So I think the trend has picked up uh, quite well. We are helping uh, a lot of tier one customers uh, and we are in discussions with them to implement this kind of a business case and an ROI model to go to cloud and microservices architecture. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sachin, and for sharing those very useful insights with us. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.